Hi, I'm Sandy Laws, and welcome to my podcast, Journey with Jesus. And I'm here again with my friend and co-host and producer, Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah, we're getting to the heart of the story today. We're talking about the birth of Jesus. How excited are you? Very excited. Obviously, this is the part that we all latch on to. And this is the part where it feels like everything we've been waiting for to this point is now here and arrived. Yes. Well, it's true that this is the part that everybody knows the best because uh, it's in movies and on TV and in our greeting cards. And it's just the constant message about Mary and Joseph and uh, Jesus in being born in Bethlehem. But I think it's good just to refresh that the story actually starts in the New Testament with the story of uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth and Gabriel and John. So that is what came before. And it's important because, you know, John was, is the forerunner before Jesus. He's the prophet of Jesus. So of course, we want to know his story first, since he is ahead of Jesus. And now we turn to the story about uh, the birth of Christ. Uh, I think we constantly mix this story in with Santa and also with paganism because Christmas is the holiday that everybody loves to enjoy and and party and go to parties and overeat and overindulge. And, you know, you don't have to be a Christian to enjoy being with people. It's not a specific holiday for Christians. So right. it's I kind of think of it as a big snowball, right? It starts as a little Christianity, the birth of Jesus start, starts as a little snowball, and it starts to go down the hill. Before you know it, all this stuff is added into the snowball, all these cultural things, and it ends up being a gigantic snowball that's all mixed together. And that's how we go through it every year. At least that's how I go through it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and I love the analogy of the snowball, of, of this little thing that gets built and larger and larger and messier and messier. It's interesting. I love your setup of, yes, that is how it started with Jesus and Christmas, the the origin of the Christmas story. But now it takes me even a while to remember Jesus, right? Because even, uh, you know, pre-Thanksgiving, you're getting all the Christmas commercials. You're thinking about presents. You're organizing when family travel schedules, right? All these other pieces. And then Oh, are we are we going to go to Christmas Eve service as a family? Are we? Oh yeah, yeah, Jesus, right? Like you start right. to put it back together in a backwards fashion, almost. I think unless you listen true. to this podcast, yeah. Right? I mean, we like to have our events all planned out, and we also just love to be with our friends and family. And you know, it feels like this is the time when that really happens, and I love it too. But by the time you actually reach Christmas you're pretty much burned out on the whole thing. It's right. You've heard all the music. You've, you've gone to church and heard the messages. You've gone to Christmas parties. You've gone to, you know, the tree lighting ceremonies. And it's just, it's just a lot for us to, to undertake in 30 short days or whatever. Absolutely. And then, you know, personally for us, my oldest birthday is Christmas Eve. And oh. so Christmas Eve, like you go to a Christmas Eve service, you remember Jesus, but also you're like, you just got through with birthday festivities and then you're like, I, do I have any more presents to wrap when yeah. I get home? Right. Do I have a bike to assemble for the kids? What yeah. do I have to do tonight? Right. Well, and Rich's so it is birthday, hard to be present. Rich's birthday is the 23rd. So I, I feel so your you know pain. the pain and it's difficult because I want to separate it, but I just, you know, find it easier to take one of the presents and wrap it in birthday paper and and say happy birthday. He understands it. He's like, my whole life, it's been mixed in together with Christmas. But he also likes to see his friends and family on his birthday. So there's another opportunity to get together with people. Um, I kind of feel bad for him. I feel like they get a little cheated on that birthday. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh <laughs> We've tried all sorts of things. And it is nice, though. I, I do think that what you brought up, Grayson, my oldest, always has his family with him yeah. on his birthday, which it's odd because my youngest, whose birthday is not at Christmas, like some days it's just a school day, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I know that Rich looks at it like when he was in high school or college, all of his high school friends would come back to Evergreen, where he grew up. And it was just a big 
get together, got to see him all. So he felt like his birthday is was really special. Now it's not quite that way, but uh, yeah. I mean, I could see both sides of it. It would be great, but it also would be hard. So speaking of birthdays, at least when we celebrate a birthday, there's somebody else that has a birthday on the 25th is when we recognize it. Uh, so let's talk about that story. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I want to talk about how this story is a little bit of a puzzle, right? Because we've talked about this, how it's both in Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel. And so what we find are some common points and then some very distinct points. It's a little bit of a mashup, if you will, of these two stories. And people don't always remember, you know, who was in what story um, because they have unique people in their story. But where it really matters, they are totally aligned. And for example, uh, they agree that Joseph and Mary were an engaged but not yet married couple, that Joseph and Mary were descendants of King David, that Jesus was conceived while Mary was still a virgin, um, that he was conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit, and that Jesus was born during the reign of King Herod, and that an angel pronounced the birth of Jesus to Mary and Joseph, that the birth happened in Bethlehem, and that the family settles in Nazareth. But outside of that, their stories take a different path. Uh, as we've already seen, um, Matthew's story comes from Joseph's point of view, and Luke's story comes from Mary's point of view. And I think it's wonderful when you put them together, you get this really astounding story. And I love that they're both there. I mean, it's great that we can read both of them, but it does require for us to actually read both of them <laughs> and Absolutely. see them both. Well, I think it's interesting of my kids' births, right? Even you talk to Lori and I, and we have very different memories, and the details don't quite align. Really? About what happened. Like, how sure. so? Um, like, I remember uh, um, my youngest was born at 808 a.m. Because I 808 is a big nu is a number. I my uh, it's a there's a, a record that I love called 808 and heartbreak, and so I'm like, yes, 808. And she doesn't. She was like, no, that's not when he's born. I'm like, oh, really? Well, I'm going to go ahead and say 808 because that's a better story, right? Huh. Um, so I do think any event, right, that you go to, then unless it's archived by multiple cameras and fact finders, it's just a very human way of like what really happened. Yeah. I don't know. I think that the challenge is that this all unfolded in human time, right? Like it, it let's talk about the season again. It's days, it's weeks, it's a couple months. Well, for the birth of Jesus, the entire story uh, was several years in the making. But mm -hmm. we want to condense it into something that's bite-sized, that we can remember, that we can put on a, a greeting card. And we kind of take away that all of this was happening in real human time. Uh, so that can make it tricky to understand when different people were there and uh, how, how the role that they played and when did it happen? That can be very challenging for us. I mean, a perfect example is the nativity scene. We talked about this last time. Mm -hmm. When you buy a nativity scene and you start unpacking those characters, you put in your little barn, you start unpacking the characters, you never know really what you're going to get in that box, right? <laughs> Right, right. Well, and you and I even joked around of like, hey, I want Sandy to put together her route, Mount Rushmore of nativity scenes. And you attempted through generative AI and you got quite the result of that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that that is the biggest rabbit hole of all time. I mean, I love it, but I hate it. So um, I think I think the funniest uh, nativity scene comes from the White House and they have I don't know if they put it up every year, but. Uh, it is, it's got everything you can imagine. Uh, I think it's got the 12 days of Christmas also represented with Jesus in the stall, but all kinds of people, including modern day people and, you know, Lords of Leaping and Maids of Milken. And it's like the, everybody you could think of was there. <laughs> it's the fusion cuisine of the nativity scene. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think that was kind of a thing back in I think it's a thing maybe in Italy, but nevertheless, let's try to keep all of our characters where they belong, right? Okay. And so, so help me do that. Okay. 
Well, let's see. So let's talk about let's talk about the details of his birth, like who was there, who wasn't, and where it took place. Uh, I think that this is sometimes a question, specifically where it took p place. But let's back up and talk about why it took place in Bethlehem. And okay. do you know why it took place in Bethlehem? I don't. Let me know. Okay. So the couple lived in Nazareth. Uh, Mary and Joseph, they weren't married. They were living their lives in Nazareth. And at that time, Caesar Augustus ordered, uh, he ordered a census of his empire. And this was something that would be done in order for him to fully understand, you know, basically, what does he have? What do I got? How many people? You know, what, what does the land produce? And who's where? It's kind of a like we use it today, right? Because we've all participated in uh, a census. Mm -hmm. And the census requires that everybody go back to their uh, town of lineage, their home of lineage. And for, uh, and for Joseph, that is Bethlehem. So now the census would have taken a long time, honestly. It's not something, again, here we are conflating it into, and there was a census and immediately Mary and Joseph ran off to Bethlehem right. to count it. I mean, there's probably 50 million people. Think how long right. that would take to orchestrate. Um, but at some point now, after Joseph and Mary have had their discussion about the fact that Mary is born um, of the Holy Spirit, they make the decision, it's time to go to Bethlehem so we can be counted in the census. Now, you probably remember this part of the story what happens when, from what you recall, when Mary and Joseph go into Bethlehem? What's the scene that unfolds there? There's no room, right? Because everybody's there for the census, and then Mary just goes into labor, and they have to be. And, and there's a an, a manger or a barn scenario that that's the only place with a roof. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. Let's unpack that. You, you're you thinking they get right into town because this is how the movies portray it, right? They right. basically finally get into town and Mary is heavy laden. She's going to have a baby like right away, like in a minute. <laughs> right, right. And, There's a storm of brewing. She's in labor. He's trying to find a place, right? right? He's panicking, knocking on doors, goes up to a door. Is there any room in the end? No, no. The guy and, wakes up from sleep and he's got his lantern. Hey, no, no room in the end. Yeah. And finally, some really nice lady says, I have a place for you outside of town. It's kind of in a cave or a barn or whatever, however they portray it. You can go there right now and have the baby right now. So... But I, I'm here to tell you, my friend, that this is probably not the way it unfolded. It's probably no. not. Um, first I of all, my childhood's being taken apart now. Oh, is it? But it shouldn't yeah. be sad. That's just in the movies, right? It, okay, it, it, okay. I'm gonna let the movies be the movies. I mean, well. so I how did it go the, down? You know, the drama of it—it it makes for better drama, right? Absolutely. But you know my favorite saying. What's my favorite saying? What? You do, Never why let the that, truth get the in the truth. way of the good story. <laughs> yeah. I do know you like that saying, and that's true with this story, um, mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, it really is. Uh, it took me a while to kind of unpack too, like, or to really understand the details, how it all happened, uh, this particular point. But uh, let's go through it. First of all, mm -hmm. Joseph has family in um, in Bethlehem. So what do we do when we go to a town and there's family there? We will stay with our family. We stay with our family. Yeah, this is true even way back then. That's what people did in these small towns. Now, Bethlehem's a bigger town than Nazareth. So they oh, really? get... Yeah, it is. It's oh, a, I didn't know that. It's a... You know, Nazareth is probably 500. Bethlehem's a few thousand. It's close okay. to... It's close to Jerusalem. And here's kind of a fun fact. The main uh, business there was uh, raising sheep. Raising sheep. Okay. Yeah. And the reason why is because what got sacrificed a lot in Jerusalem? Sheep. Sheep. But the so, that, so literally the sacrifice was their industry, essentially. Yes. Oh, wow. That's exactly the way to look at it. You know, they were swapping out your sheep if it wasn't right or selling you a sheep. Those sheep had to come from somewhere. And it was Bethlehem. It was Bethlehem. So... 
So I'm pretty sure Joseph was a sensible man. We already know he was a thoughtful man. Pretty sure he had somehow connected with his family to say, we're coming, we're coming. And they take that 90-mile journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem, and they show up at their family's house, a relative's house. And houses were like two stories. The lower level, there would be a stall for the animals and then the kitchen. And the upper level would be one, maybe two rooms. And that's where the family all gathered and stayed. And on top of that would be a roof where they would spend their evenings having dinner and socializing. Okay. So they get there. Mary's pregnant, but we don't know how pregnant she is. We don't know that she's nine months and two days pregnant. She could so she's not in the middle pregnant. of labor. Yeah. <laughs> Highly unlikely. Okay. I mean, and so I, where did the line, there's no room for them in the inn, come from? The room inn in the Bible, the um, Hebrew word, uh, is translated as, as house. And um, in this case, when we think of an inn, uh, we're thinking of a holiday inn, <laughs> correct? Right. Right. But guess right. what? They didn't have very many or any holiday inns. I mean, okay, they, they didn't, didn't exist have back few, then. Apparently, yeah. I mean, so it's just a it's a translation problem. Okay. I think more likely what happened is when they got there, they're like, "This is the only private place for you to have your baby." On right. the lower level in this area where the animals are, instead of up here in the room where we are all, you know. And also the kitchen's right here. I mean, this is normal. This isn't necessarily like off in the wilderness with the wilder beasts or anything. I don't think so. Okay. Does okay. that make you sad? <laughs> no, it doesn't. No, it just is like that. I mean, that saying's a, it's sticky, right? There's no room for them in the end kind of. You know, it's a fun little thought. I, I think that it's a, it's far more likely. I'm a practical person, right? I'm a mm -hmm. logical person. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, it, it kind of bugs me to think that they'd have been running in last minute. I, Cause I would think, well, that's really poor planning on their part. Well, especially I've always been curious. I'm like, I mean, to your point about that you made earlier, it's like you get this census decree. It's not like, hey, by the way, next Thursday you have to be like this came out a period of time, right? Months prob probably prior to oh, this. Yeah. And then you also can kind of do the math. Oh, that's around the time ish. We're going to have a baby. Well, let's go ahead and get there before we're going to have the baby then. Right. Exactly. We can just have the baby there rather than. Hey, let's not wait and have the baby here. And then we're trying to travel with the baby and you and and then we might miss it. And then I don't know what the punishment would be for missing it. But uh, I don't I don't either. But I think that Joseph is again, he's he's a provider. He cares for Mary. He's always protecting her. He cares mm -hmm. very much for her. So this is an important thing. Traveling 90 miles with your pregnant wife. Uh, if I was super pregnant and he said, okay, let's get on the donkey. I probably would have said, okay, no. Right. Right. <laughs> so it just makes more sense. I don't think it takes away from the story at all. I just think it means that we have to visualize what it was actually like to live there and the spaces of where they lived and why this lower level stall made sense for them to have a baby. Because I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want my husband's relatives watching me have a baby. No. I'm sure no. your wife wouldn't have want that either. So no, I've heard stories of different situations, but yeah, no, no. I yeah. mean, yeah, we could talk about that a lot and we're not going to, but yes. <laughs> so as a recap, they got the census decree. It came in, they arrived at Bethlehem roughly a couple weeks or a couple months, somewhere in that time frame before yep. the census and before Jesus was born and they were staying with relatives. Right. Okay. So now, which all makes sense to me because, uh, you know, back in that time, it wasn't unusual to stay with people for a long period of time. In fact, mm -hmm. they literally stay there for a couple years, a couple years. And we'll talk about that uh, when we get to the amazing story of the Magi, how we know that. But 
But they were already there? You're huh? not telling me that they, they weren't there waiting for Jesus? <laughs> oh, gosh, I feel like I'm once again bursting your bubble. Uh, so, so let's talk about who there. was there. <laughs> okay, yes. It was anybody there is the question. Was any part <laughs> well, of the story Now you're starting real? to feel like there's nobody there. But that's right. not totally true either. But you okay. probably can say that. They actually had the baby on their own. Like it was just the two of them. And it was a completely normal birth, if you will. Like the actual birth itself clearly was. So no midwife, the husband's just. Hmm. Lots of people do it that way, Jeremiah. Still, they just have the baby. So maybe there's an animal or two. I will give you that. Okay. Okay. So we had, Maybe there's a sheep. I don't think Thomas the donkey was in the corner. And, okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe there was a donkey. Maybe uh, some lamb. Yeah. Lamb, maybe. Lamb? What's the plural? Whatever that would be. Sheep. 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 Right. Yes. Maybe there's one lamb or two sheep. Yes. Okay. Okay. So who is there? Because now I'm confused. It's Joseph and Mary and some animals. Okay. They have and the, the next- baby. Okay. It's what comes next that's extraordinary, right? It's okay. what comes next. Um, what comes next is that in the night sky, he's born at night, a single angel appears to say, you know, this is glor- a glorious day because tonight um, a, a child has been born. He appears in the sky and he appears to the shepherds in the field around Bethlehem. Now, why are there so many shepherds? Once again, because we learned that they 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 raise sheep there for the temple. Right. So there's a lot of shepherds. They look up in the night sky. They see an angel pronouncing that uh, tonight the Savior has been born, the Messiah. Okay. So what what do you think about that idea? Well, he doesn't say, don't be afraid, which is kind of weird, because they always say, don't be afraid, right? <laughs> and the shepherds weren't afraid? or No, they hid, didn't they? I don't think they hid, no. no. Uh, that's I'm probably say from a hid. movie, Jeremiah. No. I don't think there's no, any uh, hiding. I don't know where they would hide, maybe behind a rock or a sheep. Right. But, I mean, something's floating in the uh, sky. You're not hiding? Well, it's not like Gabriel is standing right next to you, right? It's something you're looking up, and there's a visual. And uh, there's an audible... The same An audible been born. sound, and uh, and then right after that, the heavenly host of angels. Now I know you've heard that phrase. So, right what when does that I mean? say heavenly host, what do you think about? Like the ending of Star Wars when all the blue people are floating around or whatever. <laughs> who are who are the blue people? Right? Do you know, like after the Darth Vader dies and it's Darth Vader and Obi Wan and Yoda. And they're all sitting there like, good job, you know. This must be uh, in a later version of Star Wars. I quit after the original first three. Well, this is, no, this is the, uh, you know, we're going to nerd out here. This is Return of the Jedi. Okay. Right? So after, you know, like they burn Darth Vader's body because that's what you do, I guess. And the Ewoks are having the Teddy Graham dance scene. <laughs> and then Luke walks out and he, there's the three of them sitting on the bench oh. you know, or the log, I guess. So you're thinking of just a few angels there in the sky? I don't, or? Know, I don't know. Maybe there's like all of the Jedi or the angels are there, but it's like they're it all is. blue. Kind it's of. like every Jedi, as long as there were tens of thousands of them, of the okay. Jedi. That's what we were seeing. They're still not hiding. Nobody's hide. hiding. There's no... <laughs> Come on, you see hiding. tens of thousands of angels in the sky, you're not hiding? Well... No, there's nowhere to hide because they're in a field and there's probably some rocks. But there's, there's some sheep. You could hide behind a go? sheep. <laughs> behind the sheep. So they're going to, I guess you're imagining that they run around behind the sheep or something. But no, they don't feel that way. They are excited. Like I would be okay, really excited. Okay. Like, because clearly they grew up in these traditions. They have been waiting for this like their whole life. Like they understand what's happening, right? Well, the, the shepherds, to be honest, no less than... Uh, the they're the people of the land. They know less than others about their faith because okay. they can't go to synagogue. They can't go to the temple uh, because oh. they're dirty, right? They're not clean. They can't get clean? There's no <laughs> ceremony or they can't sacrifice one no, of their sheep? No, they're, because they're busy. What are they doing? They have to watch those little huh. animals all the time. All So the, the people time. providing your sacrifice can't go to the temple? People, right, because they're not clean. They, they, 
They're not really welcome. They're kind of a lower, the lowest level of class on earth in Israel there. The lowest level. Uh, so what's great about this, though, is think about it. All those angels appear to them. Right. Not at the temple. Not the people at the temple. Right. Not the kings. Not the, the ruling religious leaders. It's this low level of people, which... I think it's actually. Is there any symbolism there for like the people that are helping farm and cultivate the sacrifices that are actually like, yeah, you don't have to do it anymore. Like, you know what? I, I have no idea whether they actually considered that because of course this is before he, he was sacrificed. Right. So this is just mm -hmm. the beginning mm -hmm. of the story. Uh, but I think they must've felt very special and a lot of awe. I mean, I would be completely awestruck. Like, what is going on? Like, because, you know, I love this imagery of how like this veil between heaven and earth okay. uh, opened up mm -hmm. because we feel like there's a distance between us and heaven. Don't we? I mean, I do. I feel that way. Like Absolutely. Some, sometimes heaven is in my mind, but it's far away. It's not right here right now, but here at this moment, heaven is open and here are all these angelic beings talking to the shepherds. I, I, I like the sim symbolism of it, of how heaven was celebrating the birth of Jesus in a really big way, like in a huge way, way beyond our Christmas parties. They're having a big celebration because, you know, God's plan is being hatched right here, right now. He's being born. And I think that's super exciting. I just think it's a great visual. So Yeah, it's, it's always wild to me because you... you we don't fully understand what angels are and aren't. We know God created them. We know on some level they have control over us, but we're the crown of the creation, crown of creation, right? And then the fact that they would celebrate, like this kind of has nothing to do with them, right? I mean, this has everything to do with us, but this, I, what does that mean? I don't know, but it's, it's interesting to me that they would have a dance party for the, our savior, not their savior per se, right? Uh, well, I mean, I think he's uh, in control of everything in the universe can, it can, and also them. Remember, he was in heaven before mm -hmm. he was born. Mm -hmm. So they know Jesus. They know who hmm. he is. And now he's been incarnated in this crazy way that we struggle to find out or to figure out into a baby boy. So, right. I, I mean, I'm guessing that they knew enough about the plan to know this is what was going to happen. And so we get this angelic vision of them celebrating that's actually happen, happening. And their beautiful voice telling the people on earth, like, because they're messengers, right? We talked about that mm -hmm. with Gabriel. Mm -hmm. Conveying this message of the Savior has come. The Messiah it's, has come. it's safe to assume Gabriel's one of these people happy and celebrating. I mean, I think so. But he's not called out specifically, but sure. The heavenly mm -hmm. host is tens of thousands of angels. Mm -hmm. uh, so immediately after getting this announcement, they because they tell him, uh, your Savior has been born in Bethlehem. And they go and they find where Jesus is. Well, we don't have the details. They don't have GPS. They just figure it out. Um, okay. they, they say to themselves, Hey, let's go and check this out. And they walk to where Jesus is. So, okay. Obviously, by the time he, they get there, his birth didn't just happen. Uh, but they are there. How many? We don't know. Uh, but we can place the shepherds in our nativity scene. They belong there. Right. Okay. How many are you putting in there? Is this 16 or is this two? What are you doing? Uh, okay. I'm going to go with. Uh, Eight to twelve to begin with. Eight, okay, so there's a there's a gaggle of shepherds, yeah. if you let me use that word. Right, gaggle right there at that stall in the lower level of the house, coming to see Jesus. Now, if you're Joseph, what are you thinking about that? I'm not cool with this. <laughs> because well, yeah, because my wife just had a baby, uh, and she's tired. I'm tired. And who are you people? But Right. The world wasn't exactly as safe as it was now. Twelve dudes show up at your door. You're like, why? 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 Yeah. 
shepherds. And undoubtedly, they and probably they brought... didn't bring anything, right? Because they're poor. They just said they're just excited. Well, right? again, Bethlehem is a small area. I mean, overall, uh, it's a, it's a bigger town, but it's a small area. So they probably just walked right from the field they were at, they were at into the town and found where he was, and then they admire him, they adore him. Um, which my question is always, okay, okay, the angels, the whole angelic host, you know, the shepherds heard it. Did Mary and Joseph also hear it? It's hmm. not clearly stated, but I've always kind of wondered, you know, uh, from the heavens, you'd think a lot of people would have heard it, but the text right. is kind of like focused on they heard it. Hmm. I know. Hmm. It's weird. It's a little weird. I never thought about that. Complex to try to figure out uh, that. But nevertheless, I think Joseph and Mary got it. Like they immediately knew, okay, you know, the one who Gabriel told us about is here now. So things might be a little different from here forward. So that's Because the shepherds show words. up, where, what happens now? Okay. Now, 40 days later... They take Jesus to the temple to dedicate him. This is the thing that every Jewish couple did. They go to the temple and they're going to provide uh, a gift. And I think they provide two birds because they're poor. They don't have the money for the bigger type of sacrificial gifts. And as they're okay. walking into the temple to uh, conduct their ceremony, um, we can see, we, we find uh, Simeon there. Now, Simeon is a really interesting guy um, because he is like a, a man who has been given special insight into the fact that he would see the Messiah before he died. Hmm. So he gets a message from God or an angel, however, that he will see the Messiah. And he latches on to that idea and he is um, focused on it. So he's going to the temple uh, on a regular basis. And in front of him walks Mary and Joseph. And he realizes that this is the Messiah right in front hmm. of him. Um, and he's so grateful to God that it actually happened before he died. But he's kind of another example of how really special things happen to Jesus right from hmm. the beginning. Mm -hmm. People who know about him, angelic hosts, the shepherds who become evangelists, go back and tell everybody what they saw. Also there at the same time is Annas, and she is a prophetess, and okay. she goes to the temple every single day and is there every single day. Once again, they walk by, Simeon is talking to him, she goes up and talks to them and realizes this is the Messiah. But she has this kind of sad and special message for Mary, where she says, basically, Jesus will be a great joy for you, but he will also be a great sadness for you, a, a, that your heart will be pierced. Mm -hmm. And that's a strong message that you will be heartbroken over what's going to happen. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's the end of the birth narrative, uh, uh, if you will. So I, I like that it ends with these two people, but to me, they're the kind of, they're part of the story that also never gets told, right? Like, right. They're kind of like Zachariah and Elizabeth in the beginning. And in mm -hmm. the end, we have Ennis and uh, Simeon. And these stories are lesser than the primary story, according to our culture, our Christian mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. But they still have something to tell us, right? Absolutely. Well, the Simeon thing is interesting because I definitely, I remember, you know, in pageantry growing up, there's some dude that run out, would be Simeon and he'd say one line and run backstage or whatever, right? The Annis, the name I couldn't recall, but I definitely remember somebody telling Mary that. And I couldn't put, I didn't know that that was right at that same moment. I didn't know. Yeah. I couldn't tell you when, I, I couldn't have told you when that story happened. Um, well, the Simeon thing is also interesting to me because if you just put in the backstory of everybody else, of... um uh, old people waiting for this delivery, right? Which again is a very relatable thing as a person of faith of things never happen on time or on your time, right? right. 
And so because you because the, the the subtext there is Simeon was happy that he got to see it, which means he's probably older and he's been waiting for a while. Yeah. That's my assumption there, right? Um, now this this Annis lady, she did she do we know was she forewarned of this or did she just get this in the moment and I then think communicate it just happened. that? I'm not totally sure. Let me see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's a prophetess, so she must have had some prophetic understanding. Um, Why was she going to the temple every day? Do we know I that? I think that's just where she went. That was her ritual. Okay. Mm-hmm. And she was mm-hmm. there on a regular basis, like all the time. Um, yeah. And so she just is there as a regular course of her prophetess thing. And so... There she is when it happens. Uh, I wonder what, why, um, and this is more rhetorical than than real. I wonder why God felt it appropriate at that moment to tell Mary that message. Like, yeah, great uh, joy, and this is going to... I couldn't have he waited a little while. I don't know. I mean, it just that's that's fascinating. Like, because that's the end of what we would call the birth narrative of this, this story, right? Yeah. It's like, he's going to be both. And not only for Mary, but for the world, right? At that moment. Cause like it's deep sadness that even that we feel, at least I feel of what happened to him because of my state right. and that that had to happen to him because of me. Right. Yeah. That's a bummer. Right. I, like that's not cool. I, I, I mean, I'm happy. Yeah. I, 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 what I think is interesting about what you said is that, now we go back to Gabriel, right? And he delivers this story to her about, hey, your child is going to be great. Mm-hmm. He's going to be the savior of the world and all these amazing attributes he will have. But Gabriel doesn't say, and he will break your heart by the way he dies. Like he doesn't convey right. that information. Mm-hmm. Instead, it happens after Jesus is born and... I don't know. It's kind of, it's interesting to think about why that message would be delivered right then and there. I mean, Mary, maybe Mary mm-hmm. hadn't been thinking about it before. Maybe she's thinking, if he's going to be the savior, this is going to be great. We're well, because have- conquering king, all that mythology that's laid over him, like, maybe that was the first tempering. Like, this isn't what you think it is. Uh-huh. It's better, but it's not what you think it is. Yeah, I think it would be a completely shocking thing to hear. Like, what? You know? Mm-hmm. And also in so the back of your mind, his whole life, you'd be thinking, when is that going to happen? Like, Yeah, when's that shoe going to drop? Like when they lost him at the temple later or, yeah. I mean, you had to think like when he, like, and also it's the reality of the crucifixion scene. She had to vi- envision this prophetess like, oh, this is what you were talking about. Right. This is what I, all of this was for this. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so here's a, a question that I have for you. So. Mary seems quite remarkable, right? This this young woman, very young woman, that is is undoubting, unwavering, it appears, in this whole story. Do you think that she was normal or, or not? Like, was she just one of us or was she something different? I think what made her different, and I love this about her, is her her commitment to do what she was told to do her Mm -hmm. unwavering as you said it ability to stick with that regardless of what happened i i I think she was an ordinary young woman and Mm -hmm. she was an ordinary woman who was chosen by god not because she was different but because she was obedient and her obedience is what makes her amazing. And as I like to put it, um, even when you're ordinary, you know, as we all are, we're our most extraordinary when we follow God's will for our life, his plan for our life. So she was willing to do that at a very young age. And I, I don't think she thought about, well, what's, what will unfold? I think she thought, well, God is with me in the journey. Hmm. I know he is. And so hmm. he's going to help me navigate it. And I, I don't know. Sometimes I think we're not very good at that. Um, no. She no. was very good at it. She was very good at that. Well, and the interesting thing, um, 
let's see if I can articulate this well. I, I, I articulate this well. I have a half a thought. So you said something when we follow the will of God, but obviously the will of God isn't a roadmap of 16 different spots. Even you and I were talking about a situation in my life and you even told me very directly, I'm not sure God cares which way this goes, <laughs> right? Oh, I mean, and this is a big thing. Yeah. Well, like, I'm not sure he has, a, like, the will of God may not deem which one of these should happen. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think it was very, like, at the time you said that, I was like, yeah, I think she's totally right. You know? Yeah. So now the with, right? Like, and, and I think the, the inspiring thing about Mary, even throughout scripture, there's very few people we find that get told something that don't doubt or screw it up. <laughs> at multiple points, right? I mean, you true. can think, I mean, it's, it's super rare. Like we can think, I mean, overall we can agree John the Baptist probably. I mean, we don't know. If, I mean, I'm sure there was some doubt. I'm sure there was some doubt with Mary, but oh, it yeah. wasn't derailing, right? Where you look at a lot of these other characters, whether it's David or Jonah or whomever, I mean, completely derailing doubt or frustration with their calling. Very right? true. And Mary is one of the few examples that, she just seemed okay because even if you you think about this, this wasn't a scripted, detailed plan. It's like, hey, you're pregnant with the Son of God, right? Okay, <laughs> like, and then you, she just raises him, and then kind of like later on, she's like, hey, Jesus, go fix this wedding, right? Like, well, that's you much could, later on, but I would say this yeah. about Mary: the way that I like to think about it is, she was a young girl, she was young. Mm -hmm. And when you're 15 years old and you're living in a small town and you've been raised in customs and around people and focusing on your family and faith and enjoying that small town community, what did she have to do when after she got pregnant? She went, She, I mean, aside from going to Egypt to save Jesus's life, she moved back into a small town and she lived her mm -hmm. life just as she would have. She didn't make any radical changes. Her life story, the arc of her story is not quite as dramatic as like David's, for example, King right. David's. So she goes back with her husband and they have their business and they raise all their kids and they are still living with their family close by. And uh, I guess, I think that just gave her a lot of solitude, like the day-to-dayness of life. Hmm. I, obviously, in her mind, she's always thinking, well, what's going to happen? But I don't know that you think about that every day when you've got six kids around. You're probably thinking about everybody needs to do what I tell them to do and make sure it all gets done because it's chaos. Um, Absolutely. And Absolutely. The, the, the kids are fighting or they're not agreeing. And no, Jesus isn't always just being perfect over there, never causing an argument. He still is human. Uh so I think she got a lot of comfort from the way that God unfolded the story. And an average, ordinary girl who gets pregnant in an uh, unusual way, but her pregnancy is an ordinary pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And her childbirth is an ordinary childbirth. And her raising of Jesus into a Jewish Torah-abiding family was what she knew how to do, and she did it. So hmm. I give her a lot of credit for keeping it real and keeping it small and simple and not freaking out and going, Oh my gosh, where should I live? What should I do? She just stick. She just was sticking to her knitting, if you will. Yeah. I think I she's like amazing. I think it helps some of the clarity too. When we, I think it's really easy to think that our God's plan for our life equals something grand. Right. Right. When, because like God's plan for your life, oh, you're Moses, you're David, or because the, these are the characters we grow up with, and these are the characters that we find ourselves thinking about, right? Mm -hmm. Where really the Mary and the Josephs were a part of the biggest plan ever set in motion, <laughs> right? Like, Indeed. I mean, you 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 can you know it might be a little trying to embellish the story, but even the thought of like. Uh, the, the wise men followed the star. What was the star? You know, there's theories the star was a supernova. Like all of a sudden, if God triggered a supernova to get people to, I mean, this is wild stuff, right? Like you say, it's a cosmic wide event, yeah. right? So this cosmic wide event, guess what? You're still going to build people's tables, right? You're still yeah. going to build people's chairs throughout your life, Joseph. And Mary, there's no servants. There's no, 
like you got to raise these six kids right in Nazareth, the small town backwoods mm -hmm. and, but it's the perfect plan. Right. Yeah. And I think that's cool. Right. Cause a lot of times we think of, we all know, well, I think of your faith. You, you come to the reality that God has a plan for you. Right how detailed it is seems very unclear, but that plan doesn't mean that you're going to be some conquering hero. It might mean that you live in a small town making tables and that's perfect. Well, and that was my point to you, Jeremiah, when we were talking about your situation is that whether you're a carpenter or you're a sheep herder, that's not what God cares so much about as it is. Mm -hmm. Are you aligned with him? Yeah. Hmm. And so when we talk about doing God's will, it's our alignment with him and our spiritual sensitivity to knowing mm. whether we are or we are not. Um, and as you go along your Christian journey, you know more about that. I can think of times in my life when I was involved, uh, when I had my own PR marketing agency, I had clients that would come through the, the door and some of them were great and some of them, you know, they're a little morally questionable. Mm -hmm. uh, ethically questionable. So then I was put in the position of trying to make a moral ethical decision in my business. Right. So yeah, you, you're constantly confronted with what does God want for you? And what are you to do about the circumstances around you to be more aligned with what he wants? Um, mm. But I, again, I love the fact that <clears throat> Mary just points out that God uses the ordinary to do amazing things. Who else is he going to use? He has right. to use people. All people are all kinds. And he also has mm -hmm. to use, he can use his angels as well. So I know what I'm going to walk away from with this week and possibly others will is how simple and ordinary Mary was. And that's probably our lives as well, right? The vast majority of us, but that still allowed the savior to be born, raised and brought to his teaching journey that enlightened all of us. Um, and that's, that's in the midst of this season of the holiday parties, the shopping, the wrapping, all these really fun things, the ordinary, the day to day, <laughs> you know, that's, that's it. That's all we got to worry about. That's all we got to do. And let's remember Mary through the season of just yeah, how simple I, I and beautiful she was. I completely agree with that. Um, I, I think about it. If I was going to wrap it up, I would say I always focus on how there's so many common elements in this story, along with some really hmm. uncommon elements. So I gravitate to the fact that, hey, this is relatable because what they did, how they lived um, is relatable because they did common things, things that we all do. And yet uncommon things happen to them according to God's plan for salvation for us. So, yeah, uh, it's this it's this sort of blending together of uh, heaven and earth, human and divine, mm -hmm. God and his creation. And it was really the beginning of something so extraordinary, something a, mir a miracle so big that we have a hard time understanding it. Um, now, for our story, like next week, we're going to talk about the remainder of the story, which includes King Herod. He's the villain in the story and the Magi and how that unfolded, which unfolded way after the birth of Jesus. And we're going to kind of wrap it up from, from there. But, uh, you know, for now, I think, uh, to your point, if we just think about Mary and Joseph and we bring that into our celebration, does everything have to be so big? Does it all have mm -hmm. to be so grand? Do we have to have the best uh, presents? Do we have to have the best decorations, the biggest tree? We don't have to make it bigger than it already is. We just have to focus on how big it is because of the reality of it. Right? Mm, so absolutely. let's keep it simple, people. Let's keep it simple. I like it. I like it. Well, I'm excited about next week when we get to learn about the Magi and the uh, maybe some more of the dramatic elements of the story. And I love how this timing's working out, right? At this point in the season, how great is it to possibly jumpstart that birth narrative from Christmas Eve to let's carry this with us? 
yeah. right throughout yeah. the season of Mary and Joseph and what happened and how simple they were and how perfect it was. And let's think about that right here, right now. Well, we still have got a lot of time left in the season to talk about that. That's right. That. You got to start thinking about it now and keep it forefront in your mind. It, it just takes the back page when we see all those coal commercials and Walmart mm. commercials and all those commercials to buy stuff. <laughs> right. Not right. So, I, I love presents. Feel free to send me absolutely. a present. Give me a present. But yes, yes. Likewise, give me all the presents. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, obviously, I, I, I'm going to get you something Star Wars oriented. That's for sure. Yes, yes. The Jedi Council mm-hmm. in blue. I have um, a Star Wars cup here. See. Oh my gosh! How perfect is that? Yeah. Is that is that Baby Yoda? Yes, that's the Mandalorian. I guess you're not supposed to call him that. Grogu. Yeah, yeah Grogu. I'm, a, I'm. He's Baby Yoda. I know he's it's not Grogu, Baby Yoda. He's his own I know John, person. John Favreau is going to hunt me down for calling him Baby Yoda, and I'm okay with that, right? Okay, well, um, I thought it was good. How about you? Yeah, I think it Did was Did you great. feel like there was more of me? Personally? Absolutely. You were. You came out so beautifully in this one. I loved how your personality really shone yeah. in that. So it's like, and I think that's going to be your journey in the next period of time of how do you blend teacher Sandy with Sandy Sandy? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Because there is the time where you have to put on like, hey, I know what I'm talking about here. This is a thing. And then also like, but man, you're just so fun. That's who I want to engage with. Right. And I also I was thinking about in 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 branding, uh, you know, there's this concept called laddering. Right. And laddering is is where laddering laddering to walking up. And so basically it's this concept of what are you really good at that your competition is not good at. Right. Yeah. And I think what you're really good at is you're not clergy. You're not of the church. You're not, you didn't come up through that system. This is your second career, right? I think that's your superpower. And I think you need to wield that, right? You're not Kurt. You're not, you didn't go do all of this stuff, right? You you are just a person that fell in love with Jesus that learned about him. Yeah. And I think that is your brand. That is your superpower because nobody else can come against that. I mean, and, and it's not competitive per se, but it's differentiating. Yes. Right. For I who do and believe what you it's are. a differentiator. Right. So I think the more we can show people like, yeah, I ran a PR company for a bazillion years and I have my kids and then I did this. Yeah. That's cool. Right. And not to mention, I think it's inspirational for people like my mother-in-law. It's like, you can still go live a life and do things, right? You can still make an impact on this world, even though some of these other milestones are in your rear view. Yeah. You go do stuff. Dude, right? you need to keep it going until you die. Otherwise, Absolutely. you're just bored. So I think I've been thinking about that. You know, I've got this, at some point I'll show you soon. I've got this whole like brand thing for you that I've been working on. Yay. And... What are your differentiators? So what is your laddering? What is just the the bread and butter of your brand? What And I think that a lot of that comes back to the meld between Teacher Sandy and Sandy Sandy. And PR that always Sandy. easy for me because I'm conveying information as, I'm, as I have thought about it. So I think I'm in it the way I'm telling mm-hmm. it, but I'm not personally in it, right? For I mean, sure. Personally and also, I think in that I believe he was born in a certain place. So that's a personal decision on my part. Right. And also, I think that you you have this, this problem, this, this situation you've been put in because of the generation that you grew up in, where I think you're still fighting for legitimacy from the institution. Well. Right? Because yeah. that's never been easily handed to you. And no I think kidding. that. And I think that, that that's something, I don't know. I think you should pray about that. I think you should think wisdom that. My gut is, I think you need to leave that in your rear view. Like I, like you have legitimacy, right? And I don't think you need to earn it or deserve That's it from so anybody, nice of you but to what say. you have. I know, you know, I struggle with that. Yeah. So I, I think when it comes out, I, I see you in those moments. It's like, I think she's trying to prove that she's this thing. You don't have to prove it. You are right. You are this thing. So I think from there, just be that. And if somebody doesn't accept it, they're not your audience. Who cares? Yeah. Move on. You know, you're not trying, trying to get tithe from them. Prove, am I trying too hard to prove it? Or you think it's... I don't, I wouldn't, I don't know. I'm not a counselor. I wouldn't say try too hard. I just know I can definitely tell there's moments that where I'm sensitive, like, I mean, so example, right? I didn't graduate high school, right? I have no formal education 
I'm an idiot. There's times where I, you can tell I'm sensitive about that because I will try to use more sophisticated language or I'll try to be sound and look smart. And that's me at my weakest, yeah, right? Is when I I'm trying to that. do that. Now, is that because I, um, am I trying too hard? No, I'm just being weak. I'm not living in my strength. I'm not living in who God made me. Yeah. Right. And so I think that's that. I got to run. I know. I really enjoyed today. I yep. think it's the best yet. Well, cool. actually, I don't know. Last week was really fun. But I think that our dynamic is the best yet. And I think we're going to hit it out of the park again next week. And this okay. is this is coming together. This is working nicely. I'll call you either today. Yeah. I'll, if I don't call you today, I'll text you and we'll set up a time tomorrow to work on your good. script. Yeah. For, uh, I'll keep vignette. working so, on awesome. that too. Okay. Thanks, Jeremiah. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.